group, uh, the lay Steve and um, and our guest of honor, uh, Kevita Philip, and of course uh, Andrew McNeely. Um, my name is Daniela Lieja Quintanar, and I am the curator of On Disciplinary Tactics Beatriz da Costa exhibition that will be um, open in 2024 at LACE. We have been working at uh, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions. We have been working uh, for more than two years now on this project. And this project is part of the Pacific Standard Time uh, of the Getty Foundation Initiative that uh, focuses on the intersections of art and science. And um, so we're in the research phase and this program is part of it. And um, you will know more why we are opening the research to the public. Uh, but I wanna also address that I'm very fortunate to have the support and advice of an amazing group of artists, curators and academics that has been um, advising and like really contributing with many ideas to this project. And I'm going to mention uh, some of this of the team, um, Robert F. Neidefer, artist, and also uh, the person in charge of taking care of the archive of Beatriz da Costa. Um, also, artist Brooke Singer, who was a collaborator of Beatriz. Um, we have the uh, help of uh, Mexican artist Leslie Garcia, who is our archaeologist and media advisor. Also, uh, we are working with Claire Pentecost, who also collaborate very closely um, with uh, Beatriz. Um, also, we are, uh, have the, the fortune to have Maria Michelis, who is here too, uh, artists that also collaborate with Beatriz. And Anna Brice, uh, our curatorial assistant, who has been an amazing help and uh, her thinking and knowledge also has contributed into the preemptive study group in the curricula of the preemptive study group. And then we have Andrew McNeely, who is uh, our curatorial advisor. And of course, Kevita Philip is part of the research advisory committee. So I'm really happy um, that uh, we are gonna have the opportunity to have this conversation with her. And I'm gonna give a little bit of um, an intro of, um, of the project and also of Beatriz da Costa, and then we'll pass to um, Andrew and Cavita. So let me, I'm gonna share screen. Here. Gonna, okay. So, on disciplinary tactics revisits the collaborative artistic practice of Beatriz da Costa, who work with interdisciplinary models of public intervention, workshops, labs, and critical writing. This project look into da Costa's understanding of biopolitic, environmental issues, self-care with critical research and use of technoscience. Beatriz explore through her artistic practice, concept of life, death, extinction, multi-species engagement, and the work of collectively sustaining life. So, sorry, I'm, I'm a little lost, okay. So who is Beatriz da Costa? Beatriz da Costa was born in June 11 of 1974 in Berlin, Germany. She grew up in Arensburg, north of Germany, with her dad, an, uh, a civil engineer who migrated from India, and her architect, a uh, German mom. Beatriz studied at Ecole Supérieure de Art as in Provence, France, where her interest in art and science started growing up. Beatriz da Costa was an interdisciplinary artist and tactical media practitioner working at the intersection of contemporary art, science, engineering, and politics. 
She studied also at Carnegie Mellon University, where she became part of an important community of artists, activists, and intellectuals, intellectuals work on the, working on the intersection of robotics, biology, and arts. Faith Walden, Steve Court uh, from Critical Art Ensemble, and artist Simon Penny were some of the people that were part of this community. As well, in uh, Carnegie Mellon, Beatriz da Costa uh, met Brooke Singer and Jamie Schultz, and they create uh, this collective called Preemptive Media. And this is where we, we take also um, inspiration from our preemptive, preemptive study group. Uh, preemptive Media, founded in 2006, uh, defined themselves as a group of artists, activists, and technologists who are making um, their own style of beta tests, trial runs, and impact assessments through independent research. They were looking to create new opportunities for public discussion and alternative outcomes in the usual remote and close uh, world of technology-based research and development. In 2003, uh, Beatriz Acosta moved to uh, Southern California to, uh, to be part of the program Arts Computation and Engineering, ACE with Robert Neidefer and Simon Penny at UC Irvine a highly innovative experimental interdisciplinary program granting a two-year MFA and MS degree that later uh, it becomes to the end that program. Um, so we will hear a little bit more with Kavita uh, about this program. Um, Kavita Philip also was a program faculty at ACE and um, that's where she met Beatriz and they, um, Beatriz and her become part of an, an important community there of uh, dedicated artists too. Um, the Cavita and Beatriz build a strong relationship and together they design um, classes for the students of ACE. And also um, we will be discussing, uh, both of them co-edit this amazing uh, book, Tactical Biopolitics, Arts and Activists, and technoscience, a big effort to gather multiple voices from different dif disciplines and critical perspectives. And then I found this, this, this photo of both of you in 2009, um, talking about images. Um, Pigeon Blog uh, is one of the most uh, iconic uh, projects on, of Beatriz da Costa practice. Um, she collaborated with homing pigeons, students from UCI, Kevin Ponto and Sina Hazel, and pigeons fanciers to create this uh, miniature backpacks that contain a GPS and a pollu pollution sensor. And uh, basically she was experimenting uh, the idea of collecting data uh, for an, a specific area and mapping pollution and, and really like sparking conversation about environmental issues, but also like how to autonomously generate your own um, data and also getting close to, to science and, uh, and techno science. Um, da Costa also collaborated with Critical Art Ensemble, um, a collective format in 1987 uh, by one of the members was Steve Kurtz, who also collaborated with Beatriz. And uh, she, um, this is other part of Pigeon Blog here. And uh, she contributed with um, Critical Art Ensemble with a project called Gen Terra and Free Range Grains and other ones. And uh, here you can see. Um, Beatriz with this machine that actually she designed for the Gentera project called Bacteria Release Machine. Um, Beatriz, on her last years, she developed the series of The Cost of Life, where she used her experience of living with cancer without centering in her persona and sparking a deep reflection about life 
and also uh, engagement with non-human um, living forms, health and um, health and um, environmental issues. And I'm just gonna close. Um, I just want to mention, like this is this is part of um, an important effort of echoing and uh, getting very inspired about uh, the work of Beatrice that she was really looking into um, use science and technology and uh, open it, open it to uh, communities and even artists and people that usually we don't have access and make it more accessible and also make it that we can actually have access to this um, to this important uh, knowledge that is part of our everyday life. And um, I'm part of the idea of the study group is that we actually open the research. It doesn't become, again, even if if I am a curator and studying these specific things with a group of academics, we want to open it to other practitioners to bring in a discussion and really uh, expand uh, the network around, around these important ideas. And I'm just going to close with um, a beautiful quote uh, from Tactical Media and um, and I, I just I kind of remember that why it's so important to revisit the work of Beatriz uh, da Costa and um, who, is, who is not anymore with us, uh, but her work and her legacy and her writings are here. And we wanna continue those conversation and not only uh, put it in a, in, in a time of our history, but really like, use it for us for discuss. So I'll just finish reading this quote. We believe it remains crucial to investigate, critique, and create forms of collective production, distribution, and deployment of knowledge that engage with history and culture, academia, and the public techno science and everyday life. We examine the possible recuperation of one of the movement's strongest aspects, referring to the tactical media, the inter and on disciplinary tactics exchanges among practitioners and theorists from various backgrounds, always privileging collaboration and coordination with larger strategy based movements of resistance to hegemonic forces. So thank you and um, welcome uh, Kavita and Andrew, I pass it to you. Thank you for that really fantastic introduction, Daniela. Um, so can everyone hear me okay? Because I look frozen on my screen. Okay, cool. Um, I'm joining you from my cell phone because last night my computer decided to die on me, which at a very critical, critical moment. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm operating with uh, less than ideal technological infrastructure, which we'll talk about at great length today. Um, so my name is Andrew McNeely. Uh, I'm a writer, editor, curator, and the curatorial advisor of the research phase of this exhibition. Um, to contribute to this forthcoming exhibition, I steward this reading group that um, we're all uh, here participating in. And the uh, principal goal of this reading group is to investigate the writings, art, and theories of Beatriz da Costa. And it's been unfolding in two phases. So the first phase began with um, uh, looking more closely at the theories that Beatriz was developing during her lifetime that thought about the intersection of art and science and how art might intervene into scientific research and discourse to yield to either reveal the presuppositions upon which science uh, is built on uh, or to offer a amateurist insight into rethinking how experiments are undertaken. So that was the first part and that occurred this past spring. The second part is taking a much more um, broader view and looking at the historical socio-political currents in which Beatriz da Costa lived. 
um, thinking specifically about the kinds of conversations and ideas and events that were unfolding uh, at the turn of the 21st century. Um, so aside from the ones that stick out the most to us, which would be if we think about the early 2000s, we think about the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, the early 2000s were deeply shaped by the aftermath of also the WTO protests in Seattle in 1999 and the massive expansion of the surveillance apparatus of the state following the passing of the Patriot Act in 2001. And this was very much on the tip of everybody's, or this was very much present in everyone's mind at the time among activists, artists, and scholars. Um, so to that end, uh, or to think about the way in which artists, scholars, and activists were imagining the kind of transformations that they were living through um, our study group watched a few weeks ago a documentary by the uh, uh, journalist and uh, scholar Naomi Klein that follows from a book that was very influential when I was in college that she wrote called No Logo. And um, if is it possible, I'm not sure Juan or Anna, if we could cue up that video? Yes, totally. So this is, a, uh, this is an excerpt from that film, um, which again is a film that is, a, it's a movie adaptation of a book that was published in the early 2000s called No Logo, which looked at the transformations and how branding was, uh, or transformations and how branding were beginning to create new types of con consumption and new types of, uh, um, or was also reflecting transformations in the trade networks and um, what we would end up calling globalization, um, transformations and sort of the geopolitical connections uh, that make up the world. So I wanna just watch this section of it, which tries to imagine what globalization is. So we can go ahead and play that now. So in a sense, what we're seeing is using branding that is so enmeshed in our culture and in our lives as a way back into our own societies, a way to engage with globalization. Because if you pick up a shoe now, you have the story of globalization in your hand. You have leather that was maybe produced in Argentina, shipped to, to the Philippines, produced by a Korean subcontractor that went through a Hong Kong broker that was dealing with a company in Oregon. So you're looking at this thing and if you can deconstruct it, if you can trace all the components through the global economy, and not only that, but find out how much that company that's selling you that shoe spent on advertising last year and how much money they paid a superstar athlete to, spo to sponsor them, then you, you have the disparities of the global economy in miniature, the winners and the losers. What we've seen in the past six years is an explosion of brand-based investigative activism where you have campaigners that have peeled, or looked behind the brand, peeled away the facade to see uh, how the goods are produced. There are labor groups in the United States that, that have sponsored tours of Nike workers, of Gap workers, going to U.S. campuses, to community centers, to tell people how their products are produced. And of course, this is very uncomfortable for these companies, because even though they are the engines of globalization, they don't really believe in globalization, not this kind of globalization, right? I mean, their whole system depends on the world of production and the world of consumption staying safely apart, and there not being this connection at the grassroots where we learn the secrets behind our shiny, perfect, airbrushed global world. So now these brands have become uh, in many ways, the most visible targets of globalization. So much so that whenever you see a protest, during a protest, there'll be a line of riot cops guarding the Starbucks, guarding the Gap, guarding the McDonald's. And this strikes me as tremendously symbolic somehow, that they're, they're guarding the facade, the entry point into the world of globalization. And what this activism is doing is it's putting them together. And it's going to the shiny facade of the brand outside the mall, outside the superstore, and saying, we know how your products are produced. 
that's what these campaigns do. They make globalization real. They say it's about the food that you eat. It's about the clothes that you wear. It's about the toys you buy your kids. Thank you. So uh, something that we've discovered over the course of our research and looking at the era in which a lot of this work that Beatriz de Casa made um, was appearing and was circulating in the world is um, again and again, we see many uh, uh, writers, activists, thinkers whose texts we've read have a sort of waning confidence in the um, effectiveness of direct action and a, um, uh, a, an interest or something that we've uh, observed um, coupled with this waning investment in direct action is a growing consciousness around what globalization is and trying to, um, trying to imagine how to intervene into it, I, whether it's represented as some sort of system or otherwise. Um, so for this conversation um, and to think about the broader questions of our second phase of this group, the question that I want all of us to keep in the back of our minds is, what did it mean to imagine the global at this historical moment versus today? And I think one way that we can go about answering that question is by thinking about narratives that represent, uh, represent development of the internet, the infrastructure that quite literally uh, uh, assisted these global transformations uh, versus globalization generally uh, to, the, to the kind that Naomi Klein is talking about as flows of capital. Um, so this brings me to our, our guest, uh, Kavita Phillips, whose work interrogates technological imaginaries between the global north and south and asks us what it means to decolonize the former. Uh, so without further ado, I'm excited to introduce her today. Um, Kavita Phillips is a historian of science and culture and the President's Excellence Chair in Network Cultures and a Professor of English at the University of British Columbia, Department of English, Language and Literatures. She is author of Civilizing Natures by Rutgers University Press and co-editor of five volumes curating interdisciplinary work in radical history, political science, art, activism, gender, technology studies, and public policy. Previously, Philip taught as professor in history at the University of uh, California, Irvine, and you also heard uh, from Danielle earlier that she was a program faculty in the ACE program of which Beatrice is a part. And in addition to that, in 2008, while at UCI, Philip co-edited the book Tactical Biopolitics, Art, Activism, and Technoscience with artist Beatrice da Costa, uh, published by MIT Press. This influential book addresses what it calls the growing anxieties about, the li about life, uh, excuse me, about li the life sciences at a time when firm categories such as objective truth and the human seem to be uh, destabilized. So now almost 15 years since this debut, tactical biopolitics still informs contemporary conversations about the uh, value of the arts to techno-scientific discourse as well as the possibility of making science itself uh, a public and thereby more democratic activity. Um, I wanted to begin this conversation by doing two things. The first is I wanted to ask Kavita if you could um, maybe allow us to imagine what kind of person Beatrice da Costa was, um, maybe some of your first memories of meeting her and collaborating with her. And uh, something else that I think that we could all use is maybe a, a, a stronger definition of what the word technoscience means and how you think about that in your work. So maybe we could start with the first question of how did you meet Beatrice da Costa? So first, I want to acknowledge that I come to you from the unceded ancestral lands of the Musqueam people on which the University of British Columbia sits. Um, and second, I want to thank you both, Daniela and Andrew, uh, for that phenomenal research. Um, I think you really did capture a moment in at the turn of the century where all of these questions were up for grabs, right? Globalization, activism, art, and resistance. Um, and you know we often forget that like books are this this have this weird like solid existence <laughs> that that then you know used as textbooks or references 
uh, we often forget the the moments they came out of. So that was also really useful for me. And um, I thought I would actually give you the anecdote about that book cover, um, but I'll I'll go backwards, Andrew, to answer your questions more specifically. But the, but the book cover just kind of exemplifies. Um, uh, I'll call her Shani, but uh, I'm referring to Beatrice da Costa. I know that we are all switching be between her official name and her pet name. Um, so she was she was not going to back down from anybody telling her how to do things, and the cover was one example. Uh, you know, recall that this these kinds of projects, whether it was the courses we taught together, uh, the conferences, the wet labs with Symbiotica, or the book, which was only just like one product, ironically, because of the transience of other artistic products, which I'm sure you all think about as artists and, you know, had the question of how to document and maintain art. I mean, the, the book seems like the most uh, you know, try, a, a solid thing, but but it was simple. It was actually didn't have that kind of prominence in our life. It was one of many things, many activist and artistic and educational and pedagogical work, pieces of work. But um, you know, so we we with difficulty, you know, had this contract. We were working with an editor at MIT, and for those of you who've done books, you know that the the book graphic design and um, the artist for the cover is a kind of different department in any, any university press. And they are very, if you will, um, condescending about the graphic abilities of authors. <laughs> and so they, they, they sent us what they had decided the cover would be. And it was literally a dead rat sitting on its back, lying on its back. And it was disgusting. The rat had like very detailed, like you could see the fur and the claws. Uh, that, that cover made us both instantly puke. Um, and we were just enraged. We were enraged, like all of this work and you're gonna try to sell it with a dead rat on the cover. Um, and you know, we were talking to each other, text, uh, email, whatever. We were always in different parts of the world, I think. I was in England, she was in California. We were just like livid. And we contacted the, author, the, the editor and they were like, nah, this, it's, this is not in your, your you know, <laughs> corner. This is our decision. You have no right. And you know, Shani would not take that for an answer. She would not. Um, and um, so we discussed it and we came up with Natalie's work. This is, this is obviously Natalie's artwork. We wanted a piece of art. We didn't want, you know, this ostensibly disgusting visceral thing. I mean, what is it? Telling people that techno science is this visceral thing that's dead on your counter, or so, you know, the, the message was completely wrong. Um, and so um, we got the permission from Natalie, which, as many of you know, if you've tried to reach Natalie, it's not a simple thing. Um, but but um, she did give us permission, and we offered Natalie the chance to, you know, do a cover design. Uh, but she said no, and so so Shani took it on. This is Shani's design. That is the job that the press should have done. And then we we worked on it a lot. By which I mean she worked on it mostly. She did all of this layout that you see, um, and we sent it in to MIT, and they said no way, no way. This violates all the all the rules for cover design. One of the biggest sticking points I remember is there was text. This is Natalie's text, right? Describing like the vertical text that you see uh, was describing what the image was. And they said there cannot be text on a cover other than the text of the author's name and title, which is nonsense. Ever since that day, I've like looked at, at cover design and of course cover design can have text <laughs> as graphic. Text can be graphic. I mean, that was nonsense. But anyway, uh, short story, long story short, uh, Shani won, of course. She would not take no for an answer. So that's why you have that cover and not a dead rat. <laughs> and Kavita, how did you begin working with Shani? So when, uh, I forget the exact dates that we each joined Irvine, but it was within a couple of years uh, of each other. Uh, and everybody that we each knew were telling us to meet each other. I think it was, maybe a year later that we actually met. Um, but a, a lot of our friends were telling us, you guys need to meet. Um, because I think, you know, we, we were doing very, we were asking very similar questions, but doing it in different 
modes, different media. Um, and I cannot remember how we actually started working together, but it was through ACE. Um, oh, Anna, this text is missing from the, uh, okay, something to investigate. Um, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. I am shocked. I just checked my copy of the book and it has the text on the artwork, but not on the MIT Press website. Interesting. Yeah, they really believe that text as graphic was some kind of distraction, which, yeah. It still drives me crazy, but you know, it was a it was a long drawn out global shouting match, which Shani won. So I don't have I have not met anybody who's won against MIT's graphic design department. So uh, that gives you a sense. Um, but uh, you know, if, if if you're asking for anecdotes, actually, uh, Daniela, for I I loved everything about your introduction on your last slide with the text. You had the Costa with a capital D. Whoa, she gave me a dressing down about that. The first time I sent her a document, she hated the capital D. It had to be small d, the Brazilian Portuguese spelling. Uh, and uh, I tried to define myself saying, oh, it was autocorrect, which it was, uh, which might have been your case too. But ooh, she was super pissed off with that capital D in Da Costa. Good to know. <laughs> But um, I yeah, mistaken. Andrew, I don't know if I'm I'm giving you concrete um, answers, but I mean, I think that the thing we did uh, a lot is is that teaching together, like a course. I forget even what it was called, but you know, it was everything from Foucault on tactics and strategies of power, micropolitics of power, to um, you know, artists who we would try to get to come in and talk about their projects. Um, you know, it was it was a time before the, the 2008 crash where there was money to bring people where uh, I lived close to campus and I spent a lot of time on campus. And, um, you know, obviously Shani and Robert did not live on campus, but uh, my house became my house on campus became the place where we would often hang out after work. Um, so I remember lots of conversations around my dinner table or in my kitchen. Um, um, you know, another anecdote, if you will, if you want to start with that, um, kind of more serious on the kind of life and death uh, phrase that Daniela, you introduced her with, um, you know, we, we're always overworked in those days. I mean, just all academics are overworked, but but for Shani Robert and Simon, you know, getting ACE off the ground was less, just like incredible admin overload all the time, plus this creative work that had to happen. Uh, and it was, you know, I think it was a particularly busy time. I remember I was washing dishes and she was standing across uh, my kitchen sink. And I was like, you know, you can't take a break. You, you don't have to like work like this. Uh, and she was like, no, I cannot. Uh, and she told me about living with death from her teenage years. Like, she's like, I lived with debt. I, I can die anytime. I'm, I'm working because I don't, I'm living on borrowed time. And that was, you know, I mean, that was very um, sobering. Like I didn't know anybody, I, I mean, I'm significantly older than her, but I didn't know people our age who lived with that kind of urgency, right? Um, and so, I mean, that was the first time I think I understood how much uh, the teenage cancer had affected the way that she was shaped as a, as a creative worker. Yeah, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Beatrice de Costa's life uh, story, uh, she was a survivor of uh, metastatic breast cancer, correct? if I'm not mistaken, uh, by age 14, um, if I, uh, and someone will have to fact check me on that, um, but uh, already into her early adulthood, um, she understood the preciousness, uh, uh, you know, of, of life. Um, maybe we could, because I'd like to pivot into your role in the ACE program, Kavita. Could you describe what your role in the program was and also some of the ideas that motivated the program? Well, Robert Nidefer could probably talk more to the program formally, but I was very much an informal uh, participant. Um, so there were two categories, core faculty and program faculty. So core faculty were Robert, Shani, and Simon Penny. Um, and that uh, I, there was, I guess, Bill Tomlinson, but he left early on. Uh, so it was really the three of them uh, who did this incredible work of, of uh, floating a program with, with just sheer vision and elbow grease. Um, so they drew in, uh, I think, a good strategic 
administrative move is to draw in people that we were called program faculty, a kind of, so, you know, kind of the um, outer circle, if you will, um, that was supposed to be on call for assistance. But in reality, you know, people would be listed on the website and they could choose how much or how little they participated. Um, and some program faculty participated a lot or off and on. And I ended up being very involved, uh, often would go to faculty meetings at critical times and often uh, in informal ways, you know, talk to all three of the players, Simon, uh, Robert and Shani. And uh, so I would say, um, I can't really give you like a formal CV line. In fact, now I don't even remember if it's in my CV. I don't think it is. And it was never counted for any tenures of promotions. Like it was kind of invisible. Yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, she was, uh, sorry, Maria, I'm just reading that. Absolutely. Um, ab I think that's that's right. A very, very impatient with a waste of time. And uh, she was very, very um, serious about the use of time, even, you know, while in her work, being very playful with the work. I mean, I think the word amateur and its roots in amor or the Latin amare, um, it, that that is the notion of amateur science that's at play, you know, and I, I do think, thank you for starting with her parents, because the engineering of her father and the architectural design elements of her mother both both sort of played a role. Um, so back to you, Andrew, I know we're digressing and I'm also reading comments in the chat. Um, so so bring us back if you want to to uh, to your thread. Yeah, well, I mean, it would be great to know a little bit about your experiences of co-teaching with Beatriz and also Arshani, and also some of the um, challenges that you encountered with trying to design curricula, curricula and also engage across, you know, uh, so I disclosure, I'm actually an alumni of UCI, um, and I actually have an anecdote of my own that I'll save for a second, um, but um, uh, at the UCI, all of the sort of disciplines are separated by physical bridges. So we always say across the bridge. Uh, it typically, especially if you're in the arts, you'd say across the bridge to mean the humanities. Uh, so, uh, in quite literally and figuratively, uh, the challenges that you face to build bridges across these different disciplines and engage students and get them to think like, get scientists to think like art, artists to think like scientists. Yeah, that the bridge is the perfect metaphor, right? I mean, we were always, uh, doing things that required everybody to cross those bridges, like walk across the bridge and find that studio art classroom. But um, of course, also conceptually, right? Um, so you might have heard from Robert uh, about the trailer park <laughs> that that ACE was housed in, kind of behind the science library in a kind of no man's land. Um, but, you know, theoretically connected to engineering, to informatics, and to art. Um, and this was a crazy structure uh, that required a uh, tenure. And Shani was the only one, I believe, Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, who went through tenure uh, in ACE and had you had to go through tenure in three schools, which administratively, administratively is an insane model. Um, but she, she did it, right? Um, um, of course, with, with uh, Robert's help, the, the file was just approved. Um, by every school, which I don't think I know an equivalent story in academia for an, a tenure file to be approved by three schools. So that's, that is uh, literally um, the bridge building that Shani was doing with her own work. I think in order to really convey all of this, you know, the way that Daniela set this up, the way that Andrew brought in what was going on in the 90s in the world, um, I think it was clear to her and to me that you had to have a pedagogical component, right? It wasn't enough to be the creative artist on her own, or for me, the kind of writer, the monk in the tower kind of solo writer, which each of us did, you know, obviously we have that aspect of our life. Otherwise, uh, you know, stuff doesn't happen unless you have your time alone, your room of your own. But it was clear to us you needed a pedagogical element. Um, ACE was a structure, but it wasn't enough. Uh, it, it simply couldn't do all the things we needed it to do. So um, we just kind of devised these things um, to bring people together. Like the wet lab with Symbiotica was one of them. That was one of the steps that led to the book 
happening. Um, um, but courses were another, and um, it was impossible to get courses cross-listed. Uh, I was in women's studies at the time, which itself was a kind of troubled interdisciplinary underfunded program. Uh, there was no concept, even though I was hired to do uh, techno science and feminism, there was no concept of cross-listing a women's studies class with an engineering informatics and art class. And so after going up against endless academic administrative blocks um, to cross list, we did a kind of unofficial thing, which is called cohabiting rather than cross listing. We just arranged our courses to happen at the same time and walked our students from one room to another, depending on the week. Nobody had to know we were cohabiting. Um, and it, this, it was kind of a joke term that we used uh, to get around admin is like, let's just cohabit since they won't let, let us cross list. Right. Um, so a what? lot of this was what Beatrice Shani called a parasite, being a parasite on the system. Oh, interesting. Was the explicit goal to try to encourage uh, scientists and engineers to appreciate the historical contingency of their like methods and frameworks and also to have artists try to think empirically about the, their inventions? What, I mean, what was the goal that even if it was at the time a bit nebulous and still crystallizing? Yeah. Um... I would say we weren't as specific as we want artists to do this and we want engineers to do this. Our sense, and, and I would say, uh, I think something that has not been completely explored uh, in any of our fields uh, is that unless we brought these fields together, we were all gonna be stuck in our siloed artistic, creative or intellectual historical production, right? Um, and to my mind, as a historian, these are products of a kind of European Enlightenment 18th century, uh, in which these divisions, you know, perform certain functions, and those don't work for us. Um, but yet it's, it's, you know, we, we can talk about representation, we can talk about reform of the institution, but so many of these things go unquestioned because they are baked into the infrastructure of disciplines. You know, disciplines give people the license not to think outside narrowly determined blinkered visions. Like, oh, that's a question that engineers ask. I don't have to figure out how to build this. Or that's a question that artists ask. I don't have to think about design and uh, forms of visual representation. That's an artist's job. And it's kind of weird, almost corporate outsourcing of thinking. Like somebody else will think about that. Right. Um, and I, I think that we had a sense, Andrew, that that unless we broke down those silos, new work wouldn't emerge. And I would say we weren't as uh, prescriptive as like you need to learn this and you guys need to learn that. Just what if we create the space and let people talk um, and be super critical, like not be gloves on and be like, oh, you're a historian. You could not possibly understand art or the other way around. You're an artist. You couldn't write or theorize. We kind of refuse to do those, those, you know, frankly condescending and paternalistic forms of discourse that, that substitute for interdisciplinary thought often. Um, so I would say we just were committed to creating those spaces and then, and then let people do what they do. And see what happens. See what I know. Happens. I noticed that Steve uh, uh, mentioned assembly lines, and I think that would be really useful when we get to thinking about a, a sort of post-industrial um, mentality that um, uh, you, you have an anecdote with a U.S. senator who tries to imagine the internet that we can get back to. Um, but I want to first turn to, um, for those of you who are unaware, we read two articles that Kavita had authored uh, one with other authors and uh, co-authored, and then another one that uh, has been recently released in a book called Your Laptop is on Fire. Is that correct? What is the title of the book? Your Computer is on Fire, but yeah, Your close. Computer. I'm sorry. <laughs> My no apologies. worries. Yeah, yeah. These are the things that are helpful when you have a your, laptop. You just lost your laptop last night, so that's why that's on your mind, huh? It's quite literal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, so we read these two articles and I wanna um, ask you some specific questions about them and look at some of the case studies that you, you look at in these uh, essays. But first, could you give us just a brief 
very brief description of what your research is about, just so that we have an overview. Uh, okay, so that that's a that's a big leap um, from uh, so so let, let's actually uh, Andrew, can I give you one more anecdote about Shani because I think it relates to this question of the global. Um, you know, remember it was we, she had just come back from Germany. Maybe it was a summer trip. Um, I forget beginning of the fall semester uh, or quarter, um, and she was kind of she was really pissed off. Um, because she'd had this encounter with a German on the street uh, in which one of them was asking for directions. I forget who it was. And the German guy replied to her in English, even though she had spoken in German, her native language. Um, and she was pissed off with that because that moment where the German guy misrecognizes her as a migrant and speaks to her in English, uh, she saw that as evidence that this white guy said that since you're a brown woman, you couldn't possibly be German. That that was the unspoken uh, text that she read under that, like insisted, and she kept replying in German and he kept replying in English. And she was incensed by this, incensed. So so I feel like there, were, there was this implicit story of a migration that cannot be spoken, right? A history that was buried, um, you know, the history of migration of Indians to Europe and specifically of engineers to Germany for engineering education, often allied with industrial labs like Siemens or, you know, like um, often German engineering had a kind of industrial academic tie up, um, a kind of very applied engineering thing. Two of my uncles went to, to Germany in the 70s and were educated in engineering uh, and they came back and of course, what happened with Shani's dad is he met her mom and stayed. But that kind of 70s, that early 70s moment was a moment of migration that's not really spoken of, right? Uh, either in Germany uh, or much in India. Um, and so, you know, to add to that Da Costa, like the capital D, small d question where she felt very conceptually linked to Brazil, even though she never grew up in Brazil, um, but, uh, you know, through her dad, she felt linked to Brazil, um, but also through her mom and through the fact that she grew up in Germany, she was linked to Germany. Uh, she was German. And so that was like a moment of anger over an unspoken history. So maybe, Andrew, I can use that to, to sort of transition to histories. Yeah, I actually, the reason why I wanted to lead with your research is to actually then circle back and talk about the specific subject position of da Costa herself um, and her, her story, which is bound up with, you know, uh, migration and, and uh, colonization. So, um, yeah, so maybe just in brief, if, if you could just introduce um, just the, the areas of research you're engaged with. Yeah, yeah. So, so sorry for the long detour, but... Um, I, I'm trained as a historian of science and technology, but at, the, at a time, my training was at a time when STS didn't yet exist. I, I remember being at the early meetings where people were discussing what to call this new field. Uh, I remember Sheila Jasanoff, like there were, there were names on the board in a room, in a classroom at Cornell, and that one of them was science studies, and Sheila Jasanoff said, no, I will not be in a group called SS. Um, you know, and then there was, <laughs> HPSST, history and philosophy, history, philosophy, and social science, social studies of science and technology. And that was just a ridiculous mouthful. And, um, you know, but, but this is anecdote is to say that there was not a name for this thing, right? Uh, and so many people who got into this field got in for their own reasons. And my reasons were very similar to the politics you sketched out, Andrew, um, except they came from a politics of the seven growing up in the third world, the 70s, and then in the US in the mid 80s, where I started my physics PhD at the time. And of course, the early 80s in the US was the beginning uh, and middle of the Reagan uh, Bush years. Uh, and then, of course, you had Thatcher in the UK. So the beginnings of what we call neoliberalism and the loss of an imagination of nations and transnational internationalism that were, were almost romantic looking back, right? This was came out of third world decolonization, the 60s and 70s 
you know, imagining a different kind of global South. And this wasn't just India. You know, Nehru saw himself in conversation with Nkrumah and Lumumba and Tito, uh, you know, the kind of Bandung non-aligned movement uh, that was defined in the mid fifties was, was like another kind of internationalism. If you take Naomi Klein's notion of globalization that, you know, Seattle 99 like opposes, we forget that there was a kind of progressive internationalism in the 50s and 60s that, that I was kind of born into. Uh, and, and my entry into science and tech was, was always with that in mind, that science and tech build other futures and that they're not separate from literature and poetry and art and activism. Uh, the notion that those were separate, I think only came to me when uh, the things I was trying to do in grad school were seen as outrageous or ridiculous. And I had to figure out why people thought it was outrageous. And that's how I came to learn about disciplines. <laughs> I didn't, I, I was never disciplined other than through negative evaluations of my dissertation project, let's say. Um, so, so my project is really to understand contemporary struggles over science, technology, and the world through understanding the historical and philosophical and political formations of those quandaries. So, you know, if we're faced with a binary quandary, like should Elon Musk or Jack Dorsey run Twitter? I want to say, I don't want to take that binary as given. I want to go back and say, what kind of paths did we follow to reach this ridiculous choice? <laughs> Why don't we have other choices? <laughs> What happened in contingent history that other routes, roads not taken, were blocked off? And what can we do to enlarge the roads that we have in science, technology, art, and politics, rather than accept the incredibly narrow binary options that were given today? So in a sense, I'm a presentist historian. That's that's what we're called pejoratively in history when we allow present concerns to define our historical questions. But I've always been a kind of explicitly presentist historian with all the all the admitted, you know, dangers of that. You'll be accused of being a dilettante. You'll be you'll be seen as allowing present politics to influence your historical work. Um, so you know, I, I've always been a historian, but with with uh, with real tension in how I understand that discipline. Thanks for that. And also thank you for uh, mentioning uh, Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter. I know that one of our research collaborators, Hillary, has a question specifically about that, which we'll get to toward the end. Um, but one of the pieces that we read today, a text by the name of Postcolonial Computing, um, uh, really begin, introduces, is a good primer on thinking about PSDs from a postcolonial lens. Um, and uh, it's it, what it re discusses is it discusses how a more expansive view of technology and society's reciprocal relationship um, might shift the way we talk about innovation, particularly in the global South and how we understand it. Um, and uh, something that it goes on to argue is that to really reconsider or to rethink how uh, science, or science and technology studies begins to look at the world through a post-colonial lens, it, it requires us to sort of disrupt uh, racial and gender dualism, such as developed versus developing um, and scientific versus traditional. And a useful example that the article cites to demonstrate how the West imagines the global South uh, is expressed in the 2008 advertisement for the One Laptop Per Child project, which was a charitable initiative that frames global inequality as a matter of permission or prohibition, quote unquote. Um, Anna, are you able to cue up the second video that we have, which is very short, which is uh, this advertisement? And then maybe we can talk about it. Yes, I'll play it now. Thank you. Okay. I feel like the conductor saying, Anna. Sound. 
Uh, it did. I okay. heard so. everyone else your sound. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Just uh, to, for those of you who were a little bit uh, blindsided by that, what you're seeing is imagery of children either working in sweatshops or engaged as like conscripts in a guerrilla warfare of some sort, or it's, it's not terribly explicit, but it, you know, it conjures familiar imagery. Um, doing like all sorts of things and it juxtaposes them with this um, aspirational message of if only we can give these children technology, we can give them, you know, opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise be afforded. Um, Kavita, could you maybe talk about what kind of picture of the global south this kind of um, advertisement creates and why it's problematic? Yeah, thanks for taking us back to that, um, Andrew. It's, it's still disturbing to watch it. Um, yeah, because it gives a picture of globalization that does what we've been talking about as a problem, right? It, it sort of opens with this pathos, pathos-filled, abject kind of image of these children doing, uh, you know, degraded labor or exploited labor and, you know, picking up guns and being part of guerrilla warfare. Um, as if the, the perpetuation and exacerbation of third world violent conflict isn't uh, <laughs> propelled, supported and funded by first world money and arms, as if the arms market wasn't a global thing that props up, uh, you know, often like the red state economies are very much propped up by military funding. Like there is a connection between what we live in in North America and what children have to live in in the rest of the world. But so so what I what I did there was like see a connection and then observe how these connections are disallowed by these images, right? These images force us to abjectify this these children, not objectify, but see them as abject, as so degraded uh, that that what's the next step to that partial seeing that incredibly, um, problematic vision of these African children that is the savior complex, that you, the Western consumer, must rush in to save this abject child. And then, of course, you've given the text, buy a laptop, save a child, right? Um, it, it's, it's scripted so in such a manipulative and obvious manner, and yet it worked on people. Um, the, the book I should cite here is Morgan Ames' Charisma Machine about Nicholas Negroponte and uh, the One Laptop Per Child project. Um, she does it in Latin America, not in Africa, but we know this, this kind of vision of Negroponte uh, fits with this kind of techno-utopian notion and uh, Musk and uh, Dorsey and others are you know part of this techno-utopian generation, if you will. Um, that's led us to uh, have to swallow this lie. I mean, we e even if we know better, there's no other narrative on sale right now other than the techno-utopian one. And this kind of incensed us at the time. Uh, Morgan Ames had not yet written her book. Um, now uh, it, it, we, would, we would cite from that book if we were doing it again. But um, I think what we said at the time is that um, I think if you read the paragraphs following this, we're like, you know, what if these children were like the victims of climate change? What if they're, you know, forced into sweatshop labor because of the impoverishment of their communities, because of colonial legacies, because of post-colonial corporate greed? What we want to do is ask questions that force that frame open, right? Disallow those simple disciplinary frames of looking. Um, and so we, uh, it, and I, when I say we, that my author Lily Irani and I and Paul Durish, uh, who incidentally was the last director of ACE, I believe he kind of took over ACE in its its uh, last days before it was uh, was killed by the 2008 crash. I mean, so even our lives in academia were affected by these, and how much more our lives all over the world, which are dependent on these global flows of capital. So Andrew, you opened with labor and capital. Uh, and I think that's what Irani and I were trying to bring into the frame by opening with this. And is it safe to assume knowing that this article was published in 2012, that it's it's trying to call back to the 2008 book, Tactical Biopolitics? And, and to what end, for what reason did you have in mind um, for why you were talking about how a sort of uh, post-colonial uh, account 
or lens with which science and technology studies should be undertaken? Like why I refer to them as tactics or um, if you could maybe speak to that. Yes, uh, so great question. Um, I think for me, there, there's always a calling back to these earlier moments in my collaborative thinking. So while this was work with Lily Irani that ostensibly happened in informatics, which was a different disciplinary space, uh, to me, those spaces don't matter as much as the ongoing conversation. To me, uh, work is a conversation, right? Whether it's creative work or writing or teaching, they're all conversations. And for me, they're one long conversation. I think for Irani, maybe less so. She was younger when, when tactical biopolitics came out. Uh, she was not as familiar with that work, although she was always on the edges of ACE. She was in informatics and many of her friends were in ACE because ACE overlapped with informatics. So in that sense, she was aware of it, but I wouldn't say for Irani, she was as inspired by or calling back to this, but certainly for me. But I should mention that Lily Irani also comes out of some incredible activist work on Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is mentioned in that piece, but mm -hmm. she'd done activist work around software and labor practices and surveillance uh, that she has written about since then. So you can look up her work on that. So for her, it was calling back to that kind of aspect of tactics and strategy. Um, so both of us came together with a kind of commitment to exposing narratives of labor, capital, and globalization. Um, and that work came out of that. Um, we've also looked back many years later, I forget the exact dates, but we wrote a, a postscript to post-colonial computing um, about eight years after um, about how we looked back on that. So just to say, these are ongoing conversations. Mm -hmm. I was really actually shocked to learn about Amazon Mechanical Turk. I'd never heard that or seen that before having read that text. And it's wild to know that Amazon was engaged in uh, uh, developing technologies to exploit, you know, um, dis uh, workers well, well before uh, any of the bad press came out about their fulfillment facilities or, or what have you, which is really extraordinary. Um, they've really been at it since the beginning. Um, yes, I mean, I think as Simone Brown puts it, like surveillance capitalism goes back to days of slavery. I mean, these are... These are continuous projects. And again, if we say, okay, historians of slavery are in that discipline and we are talking about technology and that's different. Again, we, we don't realize these long, long histories of surveillance of black bodies and slave bodies, indentured labor. These are all part of the, the sinews, the fabric, the infrastructure of globalization two centuries ago. Totally. And, and I, I... I neglected to mention for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, what Amazon Mechanical Turk is, who didn't get a chance to read the article, it's basically a platform for companies to search out um, cheap labor overseas. Um, it's sort of what Upwork is um, for uh, software and web development. It was uh, a means by a tool by which companies could basically facilitate their race to the bottom to get the cheapest price for labor. Um, I want to uh, open it up and bring it uh, some more voices than just us two. Um, I, uh, many of our participants um, uh, um, sent in questions regarding the text that we read. Um, and I don't know if Devika is here um, today. Maybe, maybe not. Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hi. Um, you asked a really interesting question about post colonial computing. And I'm curious if you'd like to. Uh, to um, uh, uh, contribute to the conversation, or I'm happy to read it. Um, you can go ahead and read it. I love that we're talking about looking back and looking ahead because that my my question was based on post colonial computing um, being published a decade ago and and looking back at it now. But you can go ahead and read that question, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, so you write. Um, Post-colonial computing was published a decade ago. How have the tactics presented uh, in the text fared in facing the rapidly expanding notions of STS and our ideas of, quote, tech itself is the first question. Yeah, thanks, Devika. Um, it's a great question, and I've, uh, I've already indicated that these are long conversations. Um, so in a sense, uh, when you use the word tactics, you don't imply that these are like 
eternal trans historical truths, right? Um, you say the, these are the, these are the situations in which we find ourselves, and here are the the way ways we can put our levers under the gears of power. You know, here are the ways we can pause the gears of power for a moment to get our voices heard. Um, so I would say in our follow up, which we did in a feminist magazine and a feminist online newsletter called Catalyst, we were invited by. Paula Chakravarti and Mara Mills. Mara is a disability rights and technology researcher and Paula works on post-colonialism. So both of them were editors who were very familiar with and open to our critiques. And um, we began that, Lily and I um, wrote that looking back at post-colonial computing. And um, we, would, we would stand by many of our, uh, like the, the tactics that we outline in like, I think five, five different claims, um, which are just techniques that are pedagogical and strategic in the moment, as in, here's what we would do if somebody makes a claim that science is universal. Here's what we would do if somebody makes a claim that intellectual property is, you know, belongs to the innovator. We would ask, you know, what are the other kinds of innovation? So those, those tactics, I think, uh, still work, but one of the things that's really changed in that 12 years or so is the way that difference is being monetized. You know, while we were trying to point to difference as a place for some friction and some resistance, and we were calling for an attention to difference as an attention to other histories and other futures, now I think we'd be much more pessimistic about the way that difference is quickly mobilized into new strategies of capital. Right. Um, just this morning, uh, I saw uh, a note that Lupita Nyong'o is ad advertising De Beers diamonds. Right. Chris I mean, this is somebody who's got so much, so many ethics about the role she takes, who's kind of, you know, yeah, iconic for the politics of the role she plays. And it's no accident that those roles are being co-opted into a De Beers ad. Right. I mean. Uh, in other work, I read that De Beers and other kind of blood diamond uh, uh, merchants, if you will, um, diamond merchants who still work off the blood of African labor and 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 almost enslavement like situations, they are losing market share, according to other things I read, because of artificial diamonds. Like technology has given us artificial diamonds so good that many many jewelers can't tell the difference. So what do you do? You go get Lupita Nyong'o to say, hey, these are the authentic diamonds, come and get De Beers, right? I mean, that is a very quick move. It didn't take a hundred years for capital to learn that. They're doing that really quickly. So I would say, you know, 12 years ago, what the place that we thought difference was in this, in this fight, I don't think difference is a guarantee of anything. In fact, the more we celebrate difference, the more careful we have to be on how capital can use our articulations to further their penetration of more and more areas of life. It's really well said. Um, I wanna read another question uh, Devika sub uh, submitted. And I also wanna work, uh, read it in concert with a question that Chantal uh, submitted because I think they have a relationship between. So I'm gonna read both of them and then we can talk about them. Um, so uh, Devika wrote, uh, is the grip of Western Apple slash Amazon slash big tech even more firm on the global scale or are radical slash fugitive tech endeavors multiplying and posing greater threats to the myth of the monolithic innovative West? And then Chantal wrote, can the internet be separated from its coloniality or be a decolonized site? Are hackers, pirates, or other subcultures a subversion or components of the internet's coloniality? Those are great questions. Thank you, Devika and Chantal. Um, so I, I want to say to both of you, it's both. I mean, of course, there are, I love the term fugitive tech endeavors. Of course, pirates and hackers, Chantal, I don't know if you know, but that's my current work is on pirates and hackers. Uh, I don't know if you asked that from that perspective. Um, but yes, uh, there's, there's a lot of subversive energy there. But I would say that there is no way we can see these fugitive endeavors, either technological or political, 
as stable at every moment that they exist and articulate a resistance they are in potential conversation with people who would co-opt them right and i don't i, I say that it's even too clunky because the people who would co-opt them are not separate we as creative producers are always called upon to co-opt ourselves. <laughs> you know, the door is open to co-optation. All you have to do is walk through. It's not even some kind of, you know, evil corporate like ghost behind you. Yeah. You know, telling you to do the wrong thing. Like that is the future of academic and artistic work is this kind of handmaiden to the corporate future. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely, Steve. It's happening. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, underground crypto markets, uh, pirate hackers. Yeah. Um, so I want I want to say also that uh, you know it's it's uh, I mentioned Musk and Dorsey, but it's impossible not to mention Rishi Sunak and the way that the the first brown prime minister, the first prime minister from a post colonial place is being celebrated by right-wing nationalists in India, as well as right-wing conservatives in the UK. How did we get here, right? How did we get to where something we would have celebrated as a, as a success for difference and representation and the margins of empire speaking back is nothing but a takeover of a kind of corporate state nexus by an increasingly cynical, uh, elite ruling class determined to produce an impoverished global class that will do nothing but labor for this tech utopian conservative elite. So, so I think anything that we could have seen as resistant or subversive 10 years ago is already being taken over. And so that decolonized site, um, Chantal and, and um, Devika, I think I have to admit that decolonization has gone many ways and the, the dominant way is fascism, whether you're thinking of Bolsonaro or uh, India or the Philippines, um, Hungary, you know, um, the end of colonization has been the beginning of a kind of muscular nationalism that traffics with a kind of authoritarian tech uh, affordance. Tech allows or affords us the ability to be authoritarian in ways that activists haven't yet developed resistances to, right? I feel like we're resisting like some kind of 19th century factory, like those, those factory workers who put their shoes in the machine, like those union workers who organized for the five day week or against child labor, super inspiring. But hey, that's not working against this incredibly stealthy surveillance that tech and conservatism can join together uh, to form. And I think it's important to mention climate change here. These tech elite are really planning for a globe in which climate change can kill most of us and they will survive in their elite bunkers or they'll move to those parts of the world which maybe were frozen once, but will have agriculture in their imagination after this kind of apocalyptic scenario and they'll be fine. The only difference is they can't support all of us. So they're willing to let most of us go. Uh, that is a chilling uh, picture and it can you can dismiss it as conspiracy theory, but I think it fits along with this kind of tech surveillance to say that, you know, it's, it's a kind of, um, it's a new 19th and 20th century plan. Uh, it's, it's not called colonization now, we can call it techno-utopianism, but it is again a plan for a small elite to profit at the expense of most of us. And in that sense, I don't think the buzzwords of decoloniality are enough. As Steve is saying, you know, the pirates were, were inspiring 20 years ago and now they're taken. So, so I think that question remains for us. And this gathering, I think is a model. How do we bring artists and activists and, different generations and different kinds of writers and creators together to ask these questions. Um, I feel like that's an unfinished project. So so that's, I think, Andrew, Daniela, Anna, I mean, what I see you doing. Yeah, and I think a big part of that, right, is the founding question of this conversation, which is how do we imagine the global? Um, and uh, I wanna get to that really quickly, but real quick, Daniela and Anna, how are we doing on time? 
We have 30 minutes. 30 minutes? Yeah. Okay. All right, then I'm gonna just uh, fast forward to our second um, article that we read. Um, and I apologize, Chantal, I wanted to give you a, a chance to, to chime in uh, having, having read your uh, question, um, but maybe we can get to that toward the end. Um, um, so I wanna read at length a passage in the text, the internet will be decolonized, um, which for those of you who haven't read it, um, asked a provocative question, uh, what does it, and this is me paraphrasing my, in my own words, not this is an explicitly said, what does it actually mean to say that the internet both materially and virtually is shaped by colonization? Um, and in this text, Kavita writes, um, at the end of the 20th century, public discourse valorized images of information's virtuality rather than its materiality. The notion of an invisible system that could move information instantaneously around the universe was thrilling to people who thought of industrial technology as slow and inefficient. The promise of the digital was in its clean, transparent, frictionless essence. Internet visionaries were inspired by the new information technology's ability to transcend the physical constraints and linear logics of the industrial age. Infrastructural narratives had been, uh, excuse me, infrastructural narratives had been pushed to the background of media consumer imaginations in the 1990s, their earthly bounds overlooked in preference to the internet's seemingly ethereal power. Now, just real quickly, when I read this, I immediately thought of the documentary No Logo and its representation of globalization. Um, it immediately came to mind, which is why I decided to, to show it today. But in this text, you, you go on to say, a little later on, despite metaphors such as quote unquote information superhighway, which seem to remediate metaphors of physical road building that recall the infrastructural 19th century, a 21st century American public, including many critical humanist academics, uh, had come to rely on a set of metaphors that emphasized virtual space the promise of cyberspace in its most transcendent forms animated a range of Euro-American projects from cyberpunk fiction to media studies. Virtuality was of course tied to cultures with robust infrastructures and high bandwidth. So uh, Kavita, can you briefly describe why an overdetermination in the virtual existence of the internet and narratives of its development that overdetermine the vir virtuality sustain colonial narratives about the world? So great question. Let me throw up a link to Barrett Leon's um, artwork um, that we can get to in a minute. Um, but yeah, I think, let me say, let me explain this through an anecdote uh, of a conversation I had again at UC Irvine with, with a good friend, um, media theorist, Mark Poster, who uh, is also no more. Uh, and Mark and I disagreed about many things and the virtual is one of them. Uh, but, you know, he was one of these amazing intellectuals and activists. His first year as an assistant professor, he took over the admin building in the, I think, 68 uh, student rebellions um, in California. So he comes out of that kind of 60s activism. He came. And uh, but Mark, as, as progressive as he was, saw the virtual as the kind of dawn of creative work. And he would say to me, you know, now that kind of old industrial labor is obsolete. Now our labor is all like mental, creative, virtual. And I'd be like, no, Mark, it's just gone to where you can't see it. It's in my hometown, you know, it's in the Philippines, it's in Mexico, right across the border, right? I mean, so uh, for him, this was such a such an exciting moment in media studies because you got to think about representation, but it wasn't time-based linear art like the film. It wasn't static art like the photograph. To him, that was the moment in artistic production that was freeing because of the hyperlink, because of the kind of anywhere you can go, anywhere you can go aspect of the internet. Um, and he was just not used to thinking global and media studies and creativity together. That's all. Like he was perfectly willing to stand with me you know, for labor rights in India, right? But he wasn't used to, he didn't have the habit of thinking these things together. 
Uh, and that's what I mean by creating the spaces where students think these together. I mean, those were quite contentious spaces from week to week. Because, you know, if I would point out to a white boy like that, hey, you didn't think about this, they would often get really aggressive back. Like I was spoiling their joy by pointing out that it was like based on histories of exploitation. This happened many, many times, many times. I remember a, a white artist who saw streetlights in San Diego or some kind of utopian thing. And I was like, are you freaking kidding me? Um, and and that turned into such a huge fight that actually Beatrice had to calm both of us down after the class. Uh, and usually it was her getting angry and me playing peacemaker. But in this case, it was like Shani, like saying, okay, you guys calm down. Um, so, you know, these are contentious things. And it's it's very hard to have these arguments when everybody is on edge, especially after the pandemic, uh, you know, the, the kind of the, the shootings we have in universities, everybody's on edge all the time. And I just wonder if we can have these kind of conversations which need care and support and resilience. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think in, in, in uh, 15 years, it's become much harder to have the conversations we wanted to have. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I've, I've, I've wandered from your question, but I'm coming back to, to how we create these kind of conversations. Um, and to pivot real quick, um, but still to, to, to add to that, um, I don't suspect, I don't think that we have enough time to look at the last clip that I really wanted to show, which is an artwork um, from my understanding. And it's an artwork that attempts to imagine the internet and its totality. And so we can think of, again, this question of imagining the global. Um, and I really want to encourage everyone to watch the clip. I know that uh, Kavita, you just shared it in the comments, um, but can you just briefly very briefly tell us what it is before we just uh, end by uh, opening it up to uh, everyone to, to uh, chime in. Sure, uh, you're talking about Barrett Leon's um, internet, yeah. uh, mapping the internet. So I posted a link. Oh yeah, thank you for the better link, Anna. Um, this is um, a project that takes over from those kind of clunky 90s internet representations that I talk about in that article or that chapter the internet will be decolonized that Andrew referenced. Um, and I say that these, uh, these 90s maps are really problematic in that they recapitulate a kind of colonial mapping. So in, in which these mappers use terms like the dark continent for Africa because internet cables are on the edge uh, like at ports, you know, like Cape Town. And so you see lights on the edge of the continent in the maps and then inside the continent, there's no light. So it's quote unquote dark, right? And so uh, my question and, and my colleague, Terry Harpold, again, this was a collaborative moment in my first job in Georgia Tech where we talked about these maps and he wrote, uh, this was not co-authored. He wrote this for a project I had been calling science, technology and race that I ran from um, 1995 to 1999 in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and um, Terry Harpole wrote this piece in the context my, of my project STAR, Science, Tech and Race, called Dark Continents. Um, and I go back to that moment when I write this piece and I go, well, what do the mappers say? And if you look at the mappers and their so-called excuse for their clunky maps in the 90s, they go, oh, well, we didn't have the bandwidth. We just had to kind of summarize and make it look simple, like an airline route. I'm quoting from them. Yet, you know, we're lose, used to airline routes going between like London and Shanghai. But, you know, what happens to rural China, say, right? Of course, there are smaller planes or buses or trains, but that's not on the route. So they argued that that's why we left out the details. Well, you know, if you go forward 20 years from those mid 90s maps, you actually have the bandwidth to represent a lot more, right? So this is a, a beautiful experiment with more bandwidth, with more computing power, can you do different art and representation? And to me, Barrett Lyon, um, really does a beautiful job on the same question. What is the internet? Can we map the root? And what he initially tried to do was mapping every trace root, every trace of a message. You send an email message to somebody in Hong Kong. Uh, I can root that through the traces and identify the nodes that it you know, lands on before it gets to its, uh, its 
object, it's its destination. Um, and then, you know, Leon said, okay, I'll need like a 10 rooms full of supercomputers to just map everybody's trace routes all the time. Like if you just had to map this meeting right now, it would be incredibly complex, right? And then he came to something uh, that's called the border gateway protocol. It's really like the native mapping protocol of the internet is like mapping borders and gateways. You know, when a piece of information pings a certain gateway, where does it go? How does the protocol make a decision? Like I'll send it this way because there's less traffic. It has to be constantly monitoring traffic, right? So he just maps the pings on the BGP, the border gateway protocol. To me, this is an incredibly elegant technological answer to an artistic question. How do I map the internet? And at the time when this was live, I think it stopped being live about 2015, but the MoMA has a page even. I mean, it was exhibited in, in every art gallery and museum that does tech and art. Um, you could map in real time. Like if you watch these maps over time, say you hung out at the gallery for 24 hours, you could see in New York, go to sleep, London, wake up, Hong Kong, wake up. Like you could see the internet like a dynamic living thing powered by humans who have different diurnal patterns, you suddenly had that clunky static problem of the 90s replaced by a living, breathing thing. I mean, I'm anthropomorphizing it a bit, but it, if you looked at those maps uh, in the early 2000, in the 2010 to 2015, it, you, I would look at it on a daily basis. It was just so fascinating. And uh, it didn't have a politics either for or against the internet. You know, that was interesting to me. I think the 1990s really had a politics of development and saving the the dark nations from the lack of connectivity it really had a politics whereas Lyon I mean you know I'm a, I'm a critical reader of art and history I, I looked for any possible negative reading and I just couldn't find one I mean sure you could do bad things with it I imagine but uh, for most people it was a reminder that human lives and nations are underneath this abstract thing we call the internet and um, so I'll kind of stop there and let you follow the links maybe uh, just to see for yourself. It's it's archived in a bunch of places from momar to archive.org. But I've tried to reach Leon. If anybody knows him, I would love to talk to him, but my attempts to reach him have not been successful. Thank you for that. Let's open it up now to everyone. Um, I'm If anyone has, uh, I, I have to admit, I can't see everybody's screens. Yeah. So I believe uh, Nina has a question. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kavita, so much. Well, and everybody, Daniela and Andrew, for organizing this this whole uh, research project, which has been great. But I uh, think Kavita, um, I wanted to ask you <clears throat> if it's okay reaching outside of our turn of the century framework right now. Um, who do you follow? Uh, who is, and I'm going to quote you here, who is scrutinizing the power dynamics involved in this historical separation of technology and culture in a way that you find valuable? And maybe I'll connect to that unless you don't think it connects. Um, where do you see interdisciplinarity really working between artists and other knowledge producers, in particular scientists? Because scientists are funded by non-artists and often their depths are, as you say, you know, they've everyone they've been bought to some extent, right? So such a great question. Um, I know Paul Vanus is doing really interesting things. So, uh, and he was part of TAC Bio, the, the, the book, um, and he and I have been in touch. But in terms of um, science, tech and society, um, the authors in Computer is on Fire are kind of a list of people. We just scoured the field of the uh, history of tech and the SDS and politics and tech. So Sophia Noble's in there, um, yeah, Srila Sarkar. I, I would add Ruha Benjamin, who wasn't in our book. She was doing her own at the time. Um, um, so many people, Mar Hicks, who's now working on a trans history of computing, moving on from the gendered history in their first book. Um, um, so I would say there's an explosion in the fields of, you know, history of tech overlapping with responsible AI or ethical AI, which is an industry-based move. Lots of problems because industrial kind of corporate moves are always trying to, um, you know, 
uh, overtake co-opt that which is critical even while wanting to um to support it so we can think of you know google uh and their firing of timnit gabru or um the cast uh, work of then marie sundarajan she was invited to google and disinvited so there's a whole group of tech commentators that i follow i don't think uh, and it may be my ignorance i'm not sure of artists working at that intersection i think the whole question of ethical AI is just, we just need to, to spoof it because look at what's happening with Twitter and, and Meta. I mean, somebody needs to just take down these kind of over important stuffy techno utopians and kind of play with it. You know, going back to uh, Beatrice Shani's kind of playfulness, like to expose it for the uh, incredibly toxic uh, you know, racist, uh, sex misogynist, eugenicist project it is. Um, I think artists are really needed. And if there are artists working at that intersection, I should know about them. But I'm afraid I don't at this point. Um, but, you know, some of the most exciting people for me have been investigative journalists like Naomi. Uh, I think Andrew didn't know when he picked that, but I do work with Naomi Klein now in Canada. She is Canadian and she lives here in British Columbia. She's my colleague at UBC. Um, also on, on the, the Musk thing, I've just been reading a lot in the last two days. Um, I've been reading investigative journalists who are like, you know, Musk and Dorsey are not competing. They're collaborating on this thing they call Blue Sky, which is a kind of new protocol for social media. I mean, very intriguing kind of you know collaboration behind ostensible cooperation which feels to me like like monopolies like the old-fashioned monopolies of early capital and the, you know so i think there's a lot to be done here with history and the corporate sphere academia and technology and i would love to see more um more critical work at these intersections thank you so much do we have time for more questions or no? We do. Oh, excellent. Do we have more questions? I have some questions here. That... I have a question. Um, hi, thank you so much for being here. And I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about your work with Beatrice. Um, you talked a little bit in the very beginning about administration and I'm currently working with a, uh, an elementary school with a math and science tech technical school and they've asked me to create an artistic program because I do a lot of multidisciplinary work with arts and sciences and yet we have uh, this push through the district with the CTE program which is heavily uh, uh, funded by agriculture and big business in that area and I am I feel at odds because we're going to these trainings and they're essentially they're bombarding us with this idea of pushing tech in classrooms. So I'll go into this these meetings and they talk about all this technology. And then I, I was been observing in the, you know, the history department and they're talking about colonization. So how do you subvert and maybe, you know, we've been talking a lot about this, but for someone that is working with elementary schools, they're coming for them. They're coming for us, like in that at, at, at K, K through five, they're already trying to induct them into this whole world, right? So what do I do as, you know, and I'm brought there to be an activist artist to disband it, but at the same time, it's a huge system. So I wanted to know what strategies do you have from other people who have dealt with administration and districts who are off, often in conflict with each other about the messaging that they're trying to say. And for someone like myself, who has the freedom to develop a program and how the, then can I sort of do my own, um, you know, uh, sit in and, and like what you talk about the labor groups doing, you know, a, a, pro, a political protest. So thank you very much. Thanks, Pasha. What a great question. And thank you for the work you do. That is absolutely critical work at one of those junctures, I think, you know, couldn't be more important. Um, and I think you're you're getting at what um, a couple of people write in Computers on Fire, that book that Andrew referenced, uh, my most recent uh, collaboration. Um, and there's two people I'm thinking of, Janet Abate and Srila Sarkar. And they write one, uh, Janet about inner city girls who code kind of initiatives, which is doing exactly what your suspicion is. And Srila Sarkar writes about like a 
small, low-income town outside India's capital city of Delhi, where Muslim women, again, like oppressed, marginalized, are kind of being taught, quote unquote, computer skills. And both these authors are asking critically, what is happening here with what you call the bombardment of tech, right? Why are they coming for young Black girls in inner city schools and middle-aged Muslim women in India, which is marginalizing Muslims in other ways in the labor market? And one thing Janet says is that, you know, watch labor, right? If the kind of end of World War II, the story that Mar Hicks tells in their book, Programmed Inequality, um, you know, women are doing a lot of the world, the war, wartime tech and mathematics, they're paid very little. Um, and then when men come in, the suddenly the cost for software labor goes through the roof. Like suddenly white men are doing it, it's creative, expensive labor. Right. And I think we're seeing the reverse now. Um, Silicon Valley has had too much of overpaid, you know, software engineers. And besides, they're not even all white men. Here's these engineers coming from India and Iran. And, they, you know, they're also demanding these huge salaries. Let's get young black girls from, you know, Chicago and Philadelphia. Let's get Muslim women to do this incredibly low paid grunt work that we need for automated cars, like who's labeling the sidewalk and the, the lights in automated driving in, in, you know, electric vehicle driving. It's very low paid work in the third world and in North American disenfranchised context. So all the more reason why we need to talk to each other across these contexts. So, you know, to third world, first world, I would add here, you know, elementary school through high school, college and beyond, like we need to be talking to each other. There are such big silos between K through 12 education, university education and quote unquote research oriented work, which is kind of, you know, as if it exists higher than these elementary schools, but it couldn't be further from the truth. That's where we need theory, creativity, art, history. Um, so I would love to see ways for people like this group to come together to formulate projects that with your relatively kind of privileged position, I guess, are you paid by the school district or out of it? I'm paid by the school district yeah. and okay. the parents. So it's, it's conflicting because the parents in the area that I work in now, there's a lot of parents who have uh, uh, children that are, are non-white so there's a high percentage of African students. And so I think because I'm the only black teacher right now at this school, it was strategic. And I, I mean, I know I'm a part of this, I don't know what to say. It's like, you know that you're part of this game, but, but I know I also have the power because of the things I've done to play the game and manipulate the system. And so this week was just very confusing for me because they're pushing this CTE thing and they're pushing the technology. And, you know, I'm supposed to be creating these programs for for kindergarten kids with a technological edge to teach them how to be these artists, activists, and the parents are paying and the district is paying. And I'm in the middle of it. And I'm and I'm just want to make sure I make the right move on the chessboard because I see that this is where it starts really. And I've never worked with little children before, like in this age group, but this is where it's starting, that they're learning about colonization, but they're learning about the internet at the same time. And they're learning about how the manipulation that they can create uh, image, right? And, and they can create branding, branding at this age. You're thinking about it at four. And so it's just been a real, like in the last couple months, it's just been swirling around. I, I know I'm privileged for ha having education to be able to just, you know, unpack these issues, but I want to help them unpack it. Like I want to, <laughs> I want to go after this conversation and just do totally, totally, you know, off the charts that we, I want to talk about this with them. And I feel like there is a way I can make the language accessible because we need them to go back to their parents and say, Hey, I learned this in school today about, you know, that the, when we see, you know, students shooting guns in Africa, that they're actually fighting for the protection of their water source. Like no one is actually saying that at my school and we're a science magnet, but that's, what's really happening. Right. Wow. That's that's incredibly compelling. And I, you know, I would really love to see a group form. To me, these are the most compelling areas. And I, I don't know whether to call it research, creativity, pedagogy, outreach, you know, it doesn't matter what it's called, but I think that should be where 
the relative privilege of academics is turned to, I mean, why do we, you know, pay people to write papers that literally the average citation of an academic article is one to two citations? You know, maybe five people read the average academic paper, one person cites it. You know, doing this kind of embedded work is so much more important and so compelling. Um, so I would, I would love to see that happen. I think making it understandable was really key in the work that Beatrice and I did. This is exactly the reason we did pedagogy, uh, even though, like I said, we were never rewarded for the extra work it took. It never even popped up in my promotion files. Um, it's, it's absent. In fact, you, it, it's dis deliberately disappeared because it's kind of dangerous work. <laughs> but I feel like we have to use the, whatever little privilege we have to enable others to do, to go beyond where we can go alone. Thank you Thanks. so much. I appreciate that. Well, I don't know if anybody has other questions. I do have um, maybe um, connecting with this uh, privilege that you are talking, um, like being in the academia. I, I wonder if you can tell us um, like how you, how much it had changed your uh, methodology of collaboration with you know interdisciplinary collaboration with others from when you were working with Beatriz and you were creating this you know like that I know that tactical biopolitics was the result of like really bringing a lot of people in and have like workshop and the symbiotica a workshop and conferences and like how if you can I don't know if it's too big, but like trace how that collaboration has changed or even your belief about uh, cross-disciplinary collaboration has changed. And now that you have like a very important position in the academia and also like working um, with, I, I was wondering if you can also talk about uh, your collaboration with whose knowledge and the, the, the groups that you are, are working now. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I do want to point out that the quote unquote important position, I don't think would have been possible in the US. I think I had to move north <laughs> uh, for that for my for to be able to do the work I do. I, uh, uh, this is just, uh, you know, an opinion I have, I can't back it up with evidence, but I feel like uh, academia is getting more conservative in, in the US, um, also in Europe and India, where I both of places where I've traveled and worked a bit. Um, there's a kind of move back to disciplinarity. There's a kind of professionalism, which, um, you know, I mean, we, I, like I said, I came into a, to a field that didn't exist, science and technology studies. Like, you know, people complain about the job market and it's absolutely true, but there was zero job market because there was no discipline. Like we were literally just like experimenting. And I think, um, I think academia's, professionalized and of course it's important that people have to have jobs and earn their living but there's such stress over the market that that experimentation is dangerous you know it takes time you can spend five years on developing a relationship and you know all all collaborative work is built on relationships and those take time um and you know if that doesn't produce what tenure committees want to reward then then you're in trouble. And so I think it's become riskier in a newly professionalized um, academic market to take risks that are time consuming. And that's just that's just my opinion. I, uh, I'm sure somebody can do a study uh, that can say more. But I feel like, um, you know, while Canada is is subject to neoliberal tightening, it's not quite as bad as the US is. Maybe it's 20 years before the US and that neoliberal timeline. I mean, ACE was killed by 2008, you know, it, that, that 2008 crash was the so-called budget crisis that killed ACE, you know, even though, uh, you know, there's always money for something. The question is what gets killed when there's a belt tightening, right? So I did have to move to Canada to do that. And I, uh, I was, I would say, quite pessimistic about uh, the future of that kind of collaboration. Um, 
you know, I mean, one always has to have a plan B and, you know, uh, I could have done solo books until I retired, you know, I mean, it's not that I can't write solo books, it's just that I'm, I don't think solo books are going to change our situation, right? Like what I said to Pasha, like if we're not working with each other, there's only so much one more academic solo book can do. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was my plan B. I could have gone on doing that, but that that's where well, your question is at the heart of why I moved um, is that this so-called network cultures chair that I have was built on collaboration. Um, you know, there are many, many people who, who will write many more solo books than I ever will. Uh, and there's already rewards for that in academia. But this felt like a, a new space to, to articulate something collaborative as an actual center of what I do. Instead of, frankly, I was often hiding what I did collaboratively because I was looked down on. Uh, many people, actually, this has been said to me, you do collaboration because you obviously don't have ideas of your own to do solo work. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I, th I think it's the opposite. You know, we have, all have ideas, but they will only speak to the world if we speak to each other in making them come alive. Um, so I don't know, a little bit pessimistic about the state of academia in the US and in India and in Europe, <laughs> uh, not to be boosterish about Canada, but I happen to find a small space, but <laughs> back to, um, Beatrice's point about being a parasite, you know, institutions are not going to love us back. We have to be parasites on the institution. And that's why spaces like the ones you're producing, I don't know how actually you've done this. We've been speaking for a year, but I still don't know how you brought this group together, how the funding works, but this is it, you know, shoestrings, budgets taken from other places. Uh, and then the way you frame this is unique. You didn't just frame it as we're doing this particular art historical project. You framed it in this kind of broad sense of this is a project about liberation and this is a project about imagining other futures. Um, I wish there were more spaces like this. The secret ingredient to getting a space like this working is memes. You have to have good memes. So do we, uh, do we have more time for more questions? We have about five minutes, so I think we could have a last question. Awesome. Jenna? Jenna. Hi. Um, I, uh, I'm going to make this as brief as I can. I am currently working with three Indigenous uh, regional leaders, and they've uh, graciously uh, accepted stepping into the roles of artists in residence with the LA River. This is not their cultural default. They're obvious, they are simply being themselves, but in order for them to bridge uh, conceptually to a broader audience, they've agreed to be artists, seen as artists. And um, I'm looking for ways to effectively leverage this in order to blow apart uh, the binaries that you discussed earlier, um, these assumed, I binaries between the developed world and, and I read into that indigeneity, not just the global south, as well as um, as we proceed um, developing a, other alternatives besides the binary choices of that are being presented to us through technology. Yeah, I wonder, yeah. do you, does this spark yeah. ideas for you? Because we are, yeah. we're well, first, congratulations on, you know, just opening the door and including people who are not usually included as artists. That's incredibly important. Um, and I would say, as you know, as you say, they're just being themselves and, you know, begin with that. What are the issues they see? You know, uh, did you see, you know, issues of water and fire and mudslides? You know, is, is are there climate change issues? Are there issues of, of um, you know, misogynist and racialized violence in the places they live and work. You know, I would say start with where they are. Um, I do remember talking about, uh, Andrew encouraged me to think about anecdotes. And, um, you know, I do remember uh, around my kitchen table, like Beatrice would be just like tossing ideas at the wall. She was incredibly creative, right? I mean, uh, so I remember the, the story of bacteria and like, oh, how many bacteria do you think are in this square inch on the table? Like that was a conversation and very early on. 
um, and, um, you know, pigeon blog, I remember in those conversations and, you know, my role was just to be like, wow, what is the World War II history of these pigeons? Like, I remember her driving out to meet this pigeon fancier, as they were called, this guy who was still raising pigeons. Like, I mean, I think conversations, yeah, you know, what, what are they, what are they concerned with? What are their communities uh, facing? Um, and I feel like, you know, just as Pasha asked me this question out of what, you know, is happening in the schools, I would say, see what's happening in their context. And, and I think your projects will grow out of that. But I'm excited to see what comes out of your coll collaboration. Thank you. I think um, I think we can we can close now, Andrew. Um, yeah. This has been really amazing, Kavita. Thank you so much for your thinking and joining the group. And um, it's just really amazing. We will, you know, continue in working. And and I will say like we are not working towards just an exhibition. It's like what you were saying, it was not just the book, you know, it was like, is, is this study group, is like the programming, is like a book, is the exhibition and the workshops that we're gonna be able to keep um, really creating like a solidarity network, I will say, and exchange of knowledge. But thank you so much, um, Andrew, thank you so much. I don't know what you wanna, say something but thank you to all being here no i just uh well first of all uh thanks for every to everyone really i mean i, I want to echo danielle's point that you know the nature of this um this uh discussion today is not just to do yet another panel on the arts or or a discussion but really it's to sort of activate the spirit of beatrice's work which was very much about making the sort of back end, quote unquote, of research public to democratize it and to and to see what kind of possibilities come to the come to the surface when people engaged in very different conversations come together and discuss. And so, yeah, I want to thank um, Kavita for um, sharing with us her memories of Beatrice and also giving us deeper insight into her work. And then uh, also uh, Anna and Daniela, thank you for organizing this. And and uh, uh, lastly, Juan, thank you for being the man behind the curtain, making sure this is all going happening. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, for the study group participants, I just want to make an announcement that our next meeting is November 13th. And we'll be diving into Audrey Lord and Lindsay Kelly and talking about the cost of life. So exciting times. Yeah. Thank you all, Andrew, Anna, Juan, uh, Daniela, and, and all of you for being uh, so amazing. It's been great talking to you. I look forward to seeing all of your work. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Sunday. Thank Have a great. You. you too. Thank you. Bye, everyone.